so welcome to the Herland Report, Mr. Joaquin Flores. You are a graduate in uh, political science from California State University in Los Angeles. Uh, you are a journalist and also an acclaimed um, editor based out of Belgrade, which uh, we find very interesting because so many things uh, uh, came out of that city, especially in recent history, with a dramatic change in foreign policy under the Paul Wolfowitz and Dick Cheney early era of the early 1990s, maybe after the uh, Berlin Wall fell and we know the Soviet Union fell. There was a surge of happiness, I think, among Americans. And you're an American too. Yes, yes. So you guys were very happy. It was euphoria. Yes, yes. yes. Uh, I think that notion was a little bit short-lived. Yes. Uh, but we've seen how from the time of Serbia and the revolt against uh, Milosevic, through the Arab Spring and the different revolutions there, that turned out to be very coordinated. Very much so. We end up in Ukraine. Yes. So can you explain to us the connection between the revolt against Milosevic and how we end up with the same people working to create a revolution in Ukraine? Well, it's a fascinating question. And I think it's one that as we dig, we find that many of the same actors, many of the same people, and the same underlying conceptions about how to make revolution happen come from a limited number of sources. And uh, you can look at, for example, at the end of World War II. And then you had the development of NATO. And in the United States, they developed what was called trilateralism. So it was really to build up Europe and build up Japan. And that international relations was going to be based upon what was good for Japan, what was good for the United States, and what was good for Western Europe, NATO allied Western Europe, not the Warsaw Pact. And what ended up happening is, at a certain point, um, the Americans began to sort of act independently of this trilateral order. We saw the first crack with rapprochement with China. Of course, late 70s, China becomes more and more a dominant player. The Japanese hated that. Naturally, they would. Sort of a violation of this post-World War II order. Then we began to see uh, the war, for example, in Yugoslavia. How that was organized was not from the European Trade Union Commission. It was organized from University of Chicago. It was organized from what had been learned from labor and community organizing from the early 20th century. Truck drivers, coal miners, steel workers, garment workers. You know, there was a method of how to organize people who used to work under some very bad conditions and they didn't have the educations or the ability to organize themselves. And so people who were idealists from the old left, back from the century before this one, they developed these methods. And then finally, some of these methods were distilled into books. And among them was Saul Alinsky's Rules for Radicals. This would then become the work of Gene Sharp, who wrote From Dictatorship to Democracy. And this text is critical because it takes sort of the internal lessons of community and labor organizing and weaponizes it to work against people. So it's a sort of 180 reversal of the whole thing. So then we take ourselves into Yugoslavia. Now they really began to build these networks in the 80s and after the death of Tito. And Yugoslavia was already pretty fragile because there wasn't a single clear leader. You know, Tito really failed to, to sort of pick a successor. So there was sort of the different committees from the different republics that made the whole federation were leading it. But they were subject to being infiltrated. Now there's the classic ways of infiltrating things. You know, get one group of elite against the other, get people in media, military, government to switch sides. That's the old, that's hundreds and hundreds of years old, right? French Revolution, et cetera, let's say. But what was very different about this was taking this very much similar to what was used in Poland with the Solidarity Movement and create the veneer of democracy, that these are thousands and tens and hundreds of thousands of people in the street that want the government to come down. They didn't. It was usually like this or that reform, but then they like made it be 
about the whole government coming down. This was a very different process than what Christine Amanpour on CNN was showing Western audiences. So they really got the science down. You know, this works, this doesn't work. Okay, do it this way, do it that way. Now what's interesting is that one of the solutions that they figured out was going to work and how, how Otpor worked is that you had basically two types of opposition that were very a different. And yes. what is Otpor? Otpor really actually just means resistance, right, in Serbian language, Serbo-Croatian, if you will. Uh, and so it's an organization meaning resistance. And it didn't really have, it, it didn't start out having a clear manifesto. It didn't say that the government has to come down. People didn't join up or become output activists to make the government tumble. And the vast majority of them certainly didn't want to come under U.S. occupation or have a series of, of quizzling puppet, you know, American-appointed governments come in subsequently. That's not what they were in it for. Uh, they may have had different, people are very different from each other. Some liked the West, some didn't like the West, some wanted more uh, liberal reforms, some wanted to be more truly socialist, others had uh, questions of academic freedom, others were into civil society questions. So you see these are really disconnected. I mean, of course they're related to society, but they weren't really connected as in we all want Milosevic to be overthrown. This was something that was scripted and introduced later on in, in the stage of, you know, stage three of, 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 the, of the revolution. But what they did, and what we saw happen in Ukraine, and what they did the first time in, with Otpor, but it won't succeed again, is that they were able to link Serbian nationalism to Serbian uh, European liberalism. Uh, European liberalism in the sense of liberal liberalism and conservative liberalism, human rights liberalism and free market capitalism liberalism, both liberalisms, among some elements of the elite. For many generations, of course, elites in countries could send their children to schools in Western Europe. They imbibe some of these values. They mix it with their own, remix, etc. And then you had the real nationalists who were, you know, had been also fomented this extreme nationalism from the Gladio project, the Leave Behind Army of NATO, which was always bent on building up far-right nationalist movements as well. So it wasn't just like, oh, George Soros, and America is building up these sort of pseudo-fake socialist and left-wing human rights movements. They had full spectrum domination. So they also had control or their fingers in the far right. So they got the far right Albanians in Kosovo to be Albanian nationalists. They got the Croats to be Croatian nationalists. They got the Bosnians to be Bosnian Islamists and nationalists. They got the Croatians to be Vatican Catholic nationalists. And, uh, so and what's so interesting when studying uh, this uh, Otpor organization uh, also is to see how it started off with two brothers yes. just, you know, being students and thinking, how can we protest against Milosevic some, right. somehow? Uh, and, and then uh, somehow the Americans got into right. all of that, didn't they? Yes. And to study the development of Otpor going from being called Otpor to Canvas yes. and uh, applying the application of, of Gene Sharp's book. Yes. Uh, and then the CIA, how the CIA started moving yes. in on that. And the development of this so-called nonviolent, like we said, it was initially maybe something nonviolence in right. it, but it sure uh, turned out very bloody in country after yes. country. And we see how the blueprint yes. of what canvas became out of Belgrade, the same method and the same people right. were used in uh, the Arab Spring, That's in right. the Tahrir Square. Yes. For example, the same Otpo or canvas yes. leaflets that were used in you the revolts in against right. uh, uh, Milosevic are the exact same. Same words, same logos. Yes, right. used as the leaflets on the Tahrir Square. That's right. And we find the same leaflets again used in Ukraine. That's and right. one of the Norwegian doctors in Russian history, he eloquently, uh, Dr. Uh, Bjorn Detlef Nista, mm -hmm. he has eloquently uh, described and explained how the trucks shown in those photographs right. don't even exist in Ukraine. Right. So it's the same, you know. They recycled footage. Yes. You know, they, and they, and they, 
Uh, well, the odd pod fist is the, is, the, is the fist like this. And it's also used by a um, Trotskyist organization in England and the US called IS or ISO, which also receives funding through various George Soros front organizations. But, but the color revolutions too, I mean, we're, we're nearing the subject of, 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 of Ukraine yes. really. But the color revolutions being so closely funded by George Soros, right. uh, him uh, being as a philanthropist somehow, right. also being involved in all these violent revolutions in Europe. Yes. Uh, and in Hungary, I do believe they have told him to just uh, to leave. Yes, yes. And, <laughs> and, and and he's not even allowed to put his uh, right. NGO and humanitarian funding yes. into Hungary because they, you know, probably think if right. he comes with his philanthropist organizations, there will soon be large revolts in Hungary too. Yes. But let's let's talk about the Maidan and let's well, sure. uh, come to Ukraine. How yes. is Ukraine connected to this? Well, so you have, of course. When countries uh, are sold a false bill of goods um, by the IMF and the World Bank, and they're told that they need to undergo a process of structural readjustments, okay, called austerity. But in order to qualify for these things as well, they need to have what are called anti-corruption and democracy reforms. So it's actually mandated within qualify for loans from the IMF that you allow the National Endowment for Democracy and George Soros fronted organizations to go in and do that. Now there has to be some sort of firewall or plausible deniability that separates that this is actually Pentagon or State Department money, congressional earmarked money, that's being used to overthrow a government. You know, the United States, whatever's left of it, whatever sort of congressional oversight that exists, there has to at least be the song and dance of there being a firewall. Right? So they have to use a private philanthropist like George Soros. So they actually take taxpayers' money, state, state dollars, and then they funnel it into him, like suddenly he's now a philanthropist. But it's not his money. He's sort of basically the middleman that creates a firewall that allows there to be this plausible de deniability of there being a distance between gov US government policy and what this random pro-democracy billionaire is running around doing. So in Hungary, how they were able to remove Soros was first they paid off their IMF debt. That was a big event several years ago. And the government of Orban has said, we're not taking more IMF debt. Well, that liberates you from having to then accept these NED and USAID funded through Soros projects, which ultimately are designed to build a state within a state to undermine your own sovereign civil society organizations in a pluralist society. It makes you wonder what happened to the respect for international law that Oof. we used to have <laughs> in the world and the respect for national sovereignty. Yes. And that the people in a nation own the wealth of that nation. Right. And that globalism was never supposed to right. turn out this way to make 52 people or whatever it is today right. own 70%, according Incredible. to Oxfam, of, of the wealth in the world. And when we look at the nations yes. such as both uh, Libya yes. and uh, Syria yes. and then Iraq, yes. uh, before the Iraq-Iran war, uh, those were the nations that also had zero debt to the IMF. Right. And look what has happened, happened to, to them. them. So I think globalism yes. on the whole right. ending up up with no redistribution, which the old communists and, and so many spoke of back right. in the day, right. that we need to have a capitalism, and in order for the capitalism to work, uh, there needs to, we need to have the Protestant ethic to right. be, have accountability, right. Right. and to have the, you know, we can't base it on greed, we That's have right. to base it on some level of honesty, right. and there has to be a redistribution, right. and somehow an equality or an equal kind of you know, system mm -hmm. so that we don't get the, what we have today, that it's a capitalism of raw greed and yes. just a handful of people soon controlling. A very small yeah. handful of people. And it's an incredible story, you know, on the tactical level, you know, how to take disparate groups and get them under one banner to overthrow a government. So we were talking briefly in Belgrade, the protests, Otpor had a lot of nationalist support but among the intellectuals, they were liberal. 
So the solution, right, the, the uh, formula, is the liberal plus nationalist alliance. And to unify liberals with nationalists is what the color revolution tactic relies on. That's what you saw in Ukraine at Euromaidan. So then you had CNN and Western press coverage would only focus on the better, more well-spoken, educated Kievans who were Europhiles, who liked the EU, but they didn't focus on the neo-Nazi, Banderite hooligans and, you know, football hooligans and ultras that were, they were arming with guns and weapons to, to make militias that were also financed by Radio Free Europe. So the Radio Free Europe then became a Radio Free Europe party called the Freedom Party, Svoboda. And then that party began to arm militias directly financed through Radio Free Europe, USAID, and the National Endowment for Democracy. That's how they were armed. So then people thought, oh look, the Kievans are in the streets. They're at the Maidan Square. Well, many people on the ground noticed that the people who were protesting had been bussed in, mostly from Galicia, from the west of the country. And they are Ukrainian passports, but they consider themselves Galician. And they may have some right to a separate Galician nation. They certainly don't feel Ukrainian, which has always felt a little bit more like Russian. So there's been this contest and a fight over the identity of Ukraine with now Galician saying, no, Ukraine is more like this Galician-Ukrainian thing. And they want to intersect with this idea that, well, even Ukrainians are the true Russians and that the Muscovites are just the Muscovy the city of Muscovites are like these uh, cosmopolitan bourgeoisie trying to rule us from a far distance. So you have both the class dimension and the foreigner dimension. So the nationalists of Ukraine feel very much like they're on the right side of history, you see, because they feel like they're fighting against a foreign Muscovy usurper, fake Russians, because the first Russian dynasty uh, was in Kiev, not Moscow, right? So they have the history on their side, too, a little bit, right? So I find it so fascinating to see how the confluence of liberal intelligentsia, academia, the LGBTQ movement, uh, human rights, uh, and so forth, were intersected with literally sieg-hailing neo-Nazi banderites who, in another iteration, their liberal cohorts would be the first ones in the camps. And, and that's what we're commenting on here in, in Norway as well, wondering because we hear that left-wing uh, ideal of um, solidarity with the weak and non-racism and all. Yes. I, I think that's a very long time ago that the left actually in reality stood for those yes, values. Yes, it's been a long time. Uh, but we speak about it kind of, you know, it's so important not to be a racist yes. and all. And at the same time, uh, our government supports the pure neo-Nazi right. groups that, yes. uh, you know, openly speak about the need to exterminate right. uh, other ethnic groups. And at the same time, we say that the Holocaust was so horrible and pray right. this will never happen again. While they're creating And it. then again, it's happening right now yes. and we're actually supporting it. Yes. So there's so many paradoxes. Contradictions, uh, between. Yes. yes. Yes, And I, I find that fascinating, what you're saying and what you've pointed out. I, I really truly feel and I sense that most people who have been misinformed on this subject until now have their heart has been in the right place. You know, they, they really believe that these are democracy protesters in the streets. They really believe it. It's been, this whole holographic reality has been presented to it this way. But when Victoria Nuland, right, she testifies before Congress, of course there's a black budget. We don't know how much that is. But the on the books budget, $5 billion was spent just to create this Maidan movement in Ukraine to overthrow the government. And the government that they overthrew was not a Russian government. I mean, they were just wanted balanced relations with both sides. Like, it's normal in diplomacy, in international relations, like rule number one is have as many friends as possible. And the United States comes in and says, no, you must choose 
the West. You can't have balanced relations. You can't be friends both with the West and Russia the way that the government of Yanukovych had wanted and what people had voted for, by and large voted for. And the only way that they could get Poroshenko elected was to begin to ethnically cleanse the people in the east of the country, outlaw a few political parties that had historically voted along with the Party of Regions, which was the previous government party, and by only by going against every precept of democracy and civil society could they create this illusion that this was a pro-civil society movement. I mean, that's, like you said, a paradox, a contradiction. And, and it's a good thing that people are more informed now and many start to realize, I mean, there, yes. there are so many people that, and we have, have, have the sources of information that we didn't have far before, and so many people uh, look into that kind of information. And when you study, for example, the billionaire Poroshenko, I mean, yes. he was a well-known guy in, 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 in Ukrainian right. politics and probably did many good things. So I'm not right. saying that, but right. then he's portrayed as a freedom fighter and, and, right. and the salvation of, and uh, the, the, <laughs> yes. for one. And secondly, it's been quite the, uh, strange to, to watch also how active the Americans have been uh, you have the son of Joe Biden. I mean, right. he was a, a former uh, vice president to the United States. Uh, his son, Hunter Biden, is put into, of course, the right. oil and gas section right. in, in Ukraine. Uh, you have then uh, now uh, deceased uh, Senator John McCain, right. who's all of a sudden appointed the special envoy to President Poroshenko. How did this happen? Uh, right. I mean, you have American <laughs> citizens who are all yeah. of the sudden now ministers oh yes, again of oil and gas right. in Ukraine. So there, there's so many issues. And then you have... Uh, it's because the least Ukrainian government in history of it, Ukraine. It, 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 it's <laughs> quite the paradox. Yes. And when you look at the Maidan protests as well, uh, I believe uh, there were reports all over the media also about around 400 or more uh, Blackwater uh, mercenaries yes. from Eric Prince uh, yes. present. And, and yes. uh, how, how did they all of a sudden right. get in? And what were they armed? What were they not? Very good question. Uh, we even had uh, uh, um, uh, journalists coming from Norway who went down to the Maidan. Somehow all the Western journalists ended up with all these kinds of people. They spoke to a whole lot of Arab names. Right. I said that, no, we're a battalion that came here from, That's right. fr from the south, you know, yes. through Syria, through uh, uh, Turkey, and up. So apparently both Blackwater and they were apparently allegedly the ISIS soldiers and, and, you know, they're present in this peaceful demonstration. So you, you just wonder, it's you know. It's very, very strange. I mean, it's, as we were discussing previously, you have the connection between the sort of nonviolent methods of protest and then suddenly things are violently happening. It makes me think of when I look at protests in the West. Mm -hmm. uh, in the 1960s and 70s, the anti-Vietnam War protests. Mm -hmm. And you had a generation of students and, and vets who had been in Vietnam were now protesting against the war. And there were some very famous photographs, for example, of the peacenik or hippie, kind of looked like a beatnik, putting a flower into the barrel of the gun of the soldier. And you saw this sort of reproduced over and over and over again. And so people of that generation um, who were younger in the 60s, and so for them that has all this legitimacy, and now they are the ones who are controlling and owning media institutions. They are the ones who are in civil society at the top of these bureaucracies. And so they may really be drinking the Kool-Aid themselves. I mean, because they see the imagery of their youth, that this is what people look like protesting against regimes, right? So I take it how you take it. And I would even go further a little bit and say that our psychology, there's a war on our psychology. It's, it's not simply a war on this country. It's not simply a war on that country. But that the value system um, of the generation of, of hippies and peaceniks um, who then be, went into academia and then who sold out during the 80s. And then Reagan was the bad guy. So then they were like emboldened. And then when Clinton was elected, they were like, yes, this is our Kennedy 2.0, you see. And then now they're in their... 40s and 50s at this time, in the 90s, right? 
And so then they're thinking, you know, this is what it means to have a good society. Their language, their discourse, what we, I guess we now call it politically correct, right? This is the new nomenclature, right? These are the new signals of class. So it's completely debased from the old left-wing idea of working class because now the language of politically correct, now the language of this new nomenclatura, right, of politically correctness, this is the language of the ruling class, you see. And they are saying, we're going to give you democracy whether you like it or not. As an aside, just in Italy, and I'm watching VH1, MTV, whatever, they have this artist named Giovanotti, and the man just emanates fraudulence. And he's like this kind of fake hippie, and he has this song, Long Live Liberty. And everyone in the crowd is sort of like androgynous, girls looking like boys, boys looking like girls, girls are not wearing makeup, boys look very messy, anorexic, you know, and this is freedom, you see. And they're promoting this sort of gender, neutral, gender androgyny, that this is freedom. They forgot about the distribution of wealth. They forgot about the class struggle. They forgot about imperialism. Now, in the lyrics of his song, he's saying, we love freedom so much that we want to impose it on people even if they don't want it. And that is the Arab Spring. That was the Maidan. That was Tahrir Square. That was Libya. So this is what's happening, is that the new elite are trapped in the youth of the 60s and they've now projected that language and those concepts but they never extracted it from the problem of let's say class society I think there could be workable models of capitalism but let's say class society where this upwards redistribution of wealth I'm not talking about an unfair redistribution of the wealth horizontally no. that can be problematic as well against people who work hard but we're talking about, you know, the upwards redistribution of wealth. And it's not upwards redistribution in a local economy that gets, you know, reinvested at a certain point, like trickle down. That happens on local economies. But if all the wealth is being redistributed towards Wall Street or towards Berlin, well then, what happens to all these local economies, to these people? They dry up then they become the global migrants, then they become the global nomads, and then they're forced to move to the centers of capital. Now, if I own a McDonald's or a Burger King, well, I'd rather to hire Algerians and Moroccans and Filipinos, right, than students who might have their first job because, you know what, they probably know the labor, the labor law. They're going to expect more they might even start a union. So it's better to get migrant laborers to work cheap. And then we'll organize the left to say this is an issue of human rights, when actually it's against human rights. And many of these migrants are some of the most hardworking people, the, we have the most self-initiative. So now the people who are the hardest working with the most kind of like spark are leaving countries that need them to be entrepreneurs in their own countries who need them to be starting businesses and taking microloans in their own countries and they're moving and gravitating to the centers of capital, worsening this vicious cycle of poverty and upward redistribution of the wealth to the global centers of capital. That is to understand the color revolution. It's, it's, it's amazing. And on that note, I would like to thank you, Mr. Joaquin Flores for taking the time to discuss precisely the color revolutions, how to create revolutions, what actually happened in the Maidan and what's going on in Eastern Europe in connection to the capitalism of today, the geopolitics and globalism. Thank you very much for, for being here with us. Thank you.